Hi, and welcome to Oncology Data Advisor. Today, in honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're having this interview with Dr. Connie Vyshovsky. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here with you today. So as you said, um, Kira, I'm Connie Vyshovsky. I am a professor and the endowed chair um, in nursing science at the University of South Florida in Tampa. I've been studying peripheral neuropathy since it almost seems like my whole life, but I want to say since a, a little before 2000, the year 2000. So uh, it's been a passion of mine for a long time. As a nurse practitioner for many, many years, I saw patients have peripheral neuropathy and have to live with it over time. And we saw them go from perfectly functioned functional people to having trouble with their activities of daily living and quality of life. And that really struck me because as a nurse practitioner, I kind of saw patients really in more of the acute care setting. But when I started seeing people in follow-up, that's when it really hit me how much peripheral neuropathy impacted their lives. Mm -hmm. Um, so like you said, peripheral neuropathy is a significant issue in breast cancer, and I know you've done a ton of research surrounding it. Um, so what is some of the research that you've uh, conducted or currently working on uh, surrounding this? So in the past, I've looked at non-pharmacological agents, to, uh, excuse me, I've looked at non-pharmacological ways of helping patients to manage and self-manage their neuropathy because Everything that I saw published in the scientific literature in terms of prevention and treatment of neuropathy using pharmacologic agents was either contradictory, had mixed results, or totally failed. So what do we have to work with patients? And I began to explore the idea of using exercise because I was really interested in helping patients maintain physical functioning. So I did a study for with women, with 19 women who have breast cancer who are undergoing chemotherapy. And I started the study when they began their taxanes. So they had already gotten adriamycin and cytoxin. They were beginning their taxanes and followed them and gave them resistance exercises for the lower extremities to do at home. We had a very positive outcome, but what I found out was that it was difficult for patients to manage the side effects of therapy. And at that time, they were giving um, dose-dense taxanes. So every two weeks, people were coming in for their uh, taxanes. And those toxicities kind of added up quickly, and patients had difficulty maintaining exercise in the right dose and the right intensity. So I learned a lot in that study and now have transitioned. I have a large uh, National Cancer Institute-funded study looking at using gait balance and resistive exercise, still focusing on the lower extremities because it's my belief that that's what keeps you independent. And we are recruiting women now uh, for that trial. So they get the exercises or they get an attention control. It's a 16 week study. And our outcomes that we're measuring are sophisticated measures of gait, balance, uh, neuropathy symptoms, nerve conduction, nerve uh, biopsy, so looking at intraepidermal nerve fiber density and muscle strength and quality of life. So those are our outcomes, and we're still recruiting for that study. It's here in Tampa, Florida. Great. That's um, definitely an amazing study and very needed. Um, so you mentioned some of the additional self-management strategies for CIPN. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any other advice for um, women who are experiencing this about how they can help to self-manage it? I do. We know that, you know, when we think about neuropathy, it is it is thinking about causing toxic damage to the peripheral nerves by the chemotherapy agents themselves that result in these neurotoxic symptoms. And these symptoms are sensory in nature. So um, numbness, tingling in the hands and feet. They are, um, there's motor symptoms that are motor muscle weakness, muscle wasting, and there are autonomic symptoms where people can drop their blood pressure from uh, lying to standing, okay, can experience sexual dysfunction and gastrointestinal um, problems. And this occurs in about 60 to 80 percent of women who receive uh, taxanes for chemotherapy. And the more exposure you have to these uh, therapies, as I mentioned with the dose-dense therapies, the higher severity and the longer you have those symptoms. So in 2020, ASCO um, published their clinical guidelines, and they have no recommendations for 
for prevention of chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, and only duloxetine is supported for decreasing neuropathic pain. There is limited and contradictory evidence for things like anticonvulsants, like gabapentin, pregabalin, tricyclic antidepressants, topical lidocaine, and we really want to avoid at all cost opioids, which are inappropriate for neuropathy. But in terms of non-pharmacological therapies, there was a 2022 publication that was a systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at some non-pharmacologic therapies that patients could engage in and found that the most beneficial effects um, were seen by um, in, in exercise. But I will tell you there are some benefits to acupuncture in terms of pain relief, um, in massage of the lower extremities and the hands, and in foot baths. In fact, we do hypothesize that, especially with the taxanes, that um, neuropathy is caused by uh, damage to the mitochondria, which are the energy producing uh, parts of the cell, and also by the drugs actually reducing um, blood flow to the peripheral nerves. So by giving a foot bath, a warm foot bath, you know, you can increase blood flow to the peripheral nerves. And that's what I postulate that exercise does. And um, the European Society of Medical Oncology also did a uh, exploration of this. And they found that exercise actually had level one quality evidence. And some of the studies are also mixed. And these are mostly because of bad study designs, quite frankly. And so uh, in self-management, exercise remains the most studied and the... Um, self-management strategy with the most evidence. So in that 2022 publication that I mentioned earlier, with, that was a systematic review and meta-analysis, this is um, a study that looked at 13 studies and found the strongest evidence for physical exercise to reduce neuropathy severity. And one study even found positive evidence for glutamine supplementation. Again, we still need lots more work in this area before we can say there's any kind of gold standard recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, those are definitely some really useful strategies, and that's really valuable to share with our audience. Mm -hmm. So in light of um, October being Bre Breast Cancer Awareness Month, do you have any messages about CIPN and awareness of it that you'd like to share either for patients who are experiencing it or for nurses and physicians who are managing it? Absolutely. I actually think that um, in terms of patients, let's be aware it's going to happen. It usually starts to happen by the second cycle of a neurotoxic chemotherapy. We want patients to monitor themselves for um, changes in their function, changes that are, include pain, because you can have obviously neuropathic pain. You can have hypersensitivity, which even the slightest touch or sheets on your feet, for instance, cause discomfort, uh, numbness, tingling, um, loss of sensation so that you have altered gait and balance, which is why actually we're studying it. So awareness and education are really paramount. For the providers and for nurses who are taking care of patients, again, monitoring them from baseline because people come to cancer with all kinds of uh, pre-existing conditions. For instance, you can have um, neuropathy from diabetes, right? And then go on to have a cancer, which you're going to have neurotoxic chemotherapy for. So monitoring is really important and telling patients what to report. Um, and then for providers to stay away from these non-proven therapies, um, therapies that are not evidence-based because they cause a great deal of frustration in patients. We just like almost try anything and throw anything we can at them in the best, with the best heart. You know, we want to help patients, but actually going from one therapy to another, to another, to it's very frustrating for patients. And so let's stick with those evidence-based therapies. Great. Thank you. That's really Thank you. Um, so my last question for you is a little bit of a different topic, um, but going back to our ODACon breast cancer conference from last year, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. have there been any recent updates um, on the topic that you presented about, which was CDK inhibitors um, or new strategies for managing their use? Right. Yeah, a little bit. So we know there are three right now, there are three CDK46 inhibitors, pavlociclib, ribociclib, and bemociclib. And there actually have been really no head-to-head -head comparisons between these agents. That's That's Right now, there are three, there are phase three trials that are in um, effect looking at these agents of both the adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. Um, and there's also um, uh, studies now 
looking at biomarkers. So one of the new things is we expect to see resistance in the CDK4-6 inhibitors, just like we have to other chemotherapies. So there's a need for prognostic biomarkers to further refine treatment. In other words, if in some patients they have more increased activity to the CDK um, RB1 EF2 pathways that are actually predict sensitivity of tumor cells to CDK4 inhibitors, we would use them more in those patients. So we're looking at right now biomarkers. The other um, new direction is looking at therapeutic drug monitoring. For many drugs, there is a therapeutic index for that drug. So we monitor serum levels or plasma levels of those drugs. And those plasma con concentrations are usually have a predefined window. Well, we just don't have that for CDK. K46 inhibitors. Um, and having that would be helpful in improving treatment outcomes and decreasing toxicity. So right now, that's you know also something that's needed in a new direction. Um, we also are now looking at increased applications of CDK46 inhibitors in the HER uh, positive breast cancer um, patients because there's some kind of crossover between um, those. Um, HER2 and negative and HER2 positive patients that they may benefit from these drugs. Also looking at the use of CDK4-6 inhibitors potentially in patients who are triple negative and also combining those um, CDK4-6 inhibitors with chemotherapy. And of course, in the pipeline are several new types of CDK4-6 inhibitors. So we'll stay tuned for all those new developments. That's great. Exciting to hear about all those new directions and um, also great to hear about your research in CIPN as well. Um, so thank you so much for coming on today to share all this information. Thank you, Kira. Thank you so much for inviting me and I wish everyone a wonderful Hello, welcome today to Oticon. I'm very happy to have you here. Welcome to the Supportive Care Summit, Managing Toxicities in Novel Breast Cancer Therapies. I'm Connie Vyshowski. I am the professor at the University of South Florida College of Nursing and the Lewis and Leona Hughes Endowed Chair in Nursing Science. Today I'm going to present on CDK4-6 inhibitors as one of our Supportive Care Summit presentations, and we'll look at that as a treatment now for breast cancer that's been emerging. And I have no financial relationships to disclose. Our learning objectives today, we're going to assess the indications and safety and efficacy profiles of CDK4-6 inhibitors for breast cancer. We're going to evaluate the clinical tools for assessing and grading adverse events associated with novel CDK4-6 inhibitors, applying strategies to optimize the safety and tolerability of these CDK4-6 inhibitors for patients. And we're going to develop educational strategies to help patients understand the risks and benefits of their breast cancer treatment plan. So important to know, breast cancer is a global cause for concern due to the increasing incidence worldwide. And while it's the second leading cause of death for women overall, it is the leading cause of death among Black and Hispanic women. We also, in the past few years, have learned that breast cancer is highly heterogeneous morphology, and therefore, a one-size-fits-all approach does not work for the treatment of breast cancer. We do need different therapeutic regimens based on the molecular subtypes. So as of January 1st, 2022, there were approximately 4.1 million women in the U.S. living with breast cancer. The number of women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer is estimated to have been about 287,000 women in 2022. Of those women, about 164,000 are living with metastatic disease. We know that the usual statistics are one in eight women will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, and one in 39 will ultimately die of their breast cancer. Also, when we see these recent increases in the rate of breast cancer, they're largely in local stage disease. And that's because advances in targeted therapies have greatly improved survival overall and survival, particularly in metastatic disease, specifically for hormone receptor positive and HER2 new positive disease. So what I'd like to go into now is the basis for our CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. So what is the foundation of the science for these 
therapies. So what we've come to find over years of treatment of women with invasive breast cancer is that the traditional endocrine therapies, chemotherapies have long been the choice. They've been pretty effective, especially for hormone receptor positive HER2 new negative breast cancer. However, we have a new understanding, as I mentioned already, that there is a heterogeneous disease. There's a lot of molecular diversity in breast cancer and resistance. This is the most important part, resistance to endocrine therapy has been widespread and now has led to the development of targeted agents. We also know that cell cycle abnormalities are common in cancer because cancer cells evade the cell cycle and they, it's how they proliferate and grow uncontrollably, the hallmark of cancer. And they've all long been considered a potential target for therapeutic treatments. We also know that giving targeted therapies has fewer toxicities and increased efficacy. So let's talk a little bit about the cell cycle. So when we, when we look at the cell cycle, first of all, we know that these cyclins, especially cyclin D, is important in cell cycle progression. We also know another major player is this um, retinoblastoma protein. And when it's phosphorylated, so when this P group is added, when it's phosphorylated, that means it's activated. And in its activated state, when it loses its tumor suppressor capability. So cell cycle progression, again, is regulated at specific checkpoints by these cyclins and associated cyclin-dependent kinases. Remember that unphosphorylated retinoblastoma protein represses the cell cycle. If it's phosphorylated, then it uncouples to this E2F, and then you get unrestricted growth, which is the hallmark of cancer. So we want to shut off those mitogenic signals that institute cell cycle uh, division. And so by doing so, we can give those CDK4-6 inhibitors to do that. So that's how we see things happening. And that's why the scientific community looked at using this checkpoint as a potential target for stopping cancer from progressing, especially breast cancer from progressing. Now, what we know also is that this CDK4-6 retinoblastoma complex is also important in ER-positive breast cancer, where estrogen actually increases the rate of progression from that G1 or growth one phase to the S phase. So it seemed a very natural target for new and novel therapies. So what we want to do is restrict that. And we actually have three agents that do that. So these are our CDK4-6 inhibitors, palbociclib, ribociclib, and abemociclib. And these inhibit the complex. So the CDK4 plus the cyclin D1 complex that's responsible for that phosphorylation of retinoblastoma protein. So it keeps its tumor suppressive property. And so it doesn't go into this cellular proliferation. So what are indications for using some of these CDK4-6 inhibitors? Certainly the adjuvant treatment of hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, and no, node positive early breast cancer in high risk patients. And those are patients with a KI67 score of greater or equal to 20%. Now, KI67 is a nuclear protein that's associated with cellular proliferation. So it makes sense that the higher that score is, or the more of that you have, the more you're going to have increased cellular proliferation. And this can be detected by immunostaining of the tumor. And the pathologist can look at this and look at the fraction of neoplastic cells that are in that population. So the higher your KI67 score, the higher positivity you are, the higher risk you have of recurrence and a worse survival rate in early breast cancer. And here's where abemaciclib comes into play because it is indicated for that uh, property. It's also indicated in first-line therapy of hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, advanced or metastatic breast cancer in combination with an aromatase inhibitor. And all three agents, ribocyclib, palbociclib, abemaciclib, are all in, indicated um, in that first-line therapy. Also indicated for second-line therapy of hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, advanced or metastatic breast cancer that's been progressed following endocrine therapy with or without prior chemotherapy in the metastatic setting or 
in the case of abemaciclib as a monotherapy or in combination with fulvestrant, as in the case of all three agents. But I want you to know and take away here is that abemaciclib is the only CDK4-6 inhibitor that's been granted FDA approval as monotherapy for hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, advanced or metastatic breast cancer after progression on endocrine therapy or chemotherapy. And that's indicative of its high potential as a single agent. So that's important to know. So what we want to talk about next is the safety and efficacy profile of these agents. So beginning with the uh, Paloma 2 trial, which was uh, done for untreated advanced breast cancer, looking at the safety and efficacy, when we look at the medium progression-free survival, when you give palbociclib plus letrozole, you have a 24.8 month survival as compared to 14.5 with letrozole alone. So that's a significant difference in median progression-free survival. In terms of the overall response rate, you have an overall response rate of the combination of palbociclib and letrozole of 55.3% versus 44.4% with letrozole alone. And again, that's significantly different between the two groups. Most commonly, we see adverse events uh, with uh, palbociclib and Letrozole or neutropenia, about 66% of the patients, leukopenia in about a quarter of the patients, anemia, and fatigue. And we'll talk about managing those effects later. When we look at the Mona Lisa trial with ribocyclib for untreated advanced breast cancer, when we look at the efficacy, we're looking at the probability of progression-free survival. And you can see that they start off about the same up until about you know four or five months. Then they start to have a significant difference between the groups. And you see how that splits off, especially long-term at 24 months. So you can see that the progression-free survival is significantly better in the group that had ribocyclib versus the group that did not. Again, in this trial, we looked at safety. And again, the most common grade three or four adverse events with ribocyclib plus letrozole with neutropenia, leukopenia, hypertension, and increased liver enzymes, and specifically increased ALT. So some of these you're going to see are the same. So they do affect the bone marrow to some degree. But in this case, we also have to watch out for hypertension and increased liver enzymes. We, when we look at the Monarch E trial, this is the trial of adjuvant um, abemaciclib plus estrogen therapy. And we look at the efficacy here, we're looking at a phase three international randomized open label trial. So it had about 5,000 patients in it. So women or men with high risk node positive, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, early stage breast cancer, whether or not they had chemotherapy, pre or post menopausal and so on. And they also had, as we talked about, that high KI67 index, because remember, this is for early stage breast cancer. So abemaciclib was given at 150 milligrams BID, so twice a day, for two years, plus endocrine therapy, per the standard of care of the physician's choice. And this was given for five to 10 years, as clinically indicated. And you can see each group had about a little over 2,000 patients in it as compared to endocrine therapy of the physician's choice. The primary endpoint here is invasive disease-free survival, which makes sense. You have an, a high-risk group with early-stage breast cancer. We want to make sure it doesn't progress to invasive disease. So when we look at the results of the Monarch E trial, what we find is those patients with that high KI67 scores experience a significant invasive disease-free survival improvement with the addition of abemaciclib plus endocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy alone. And you can see how at about 24 months, those groups really split off. So the long-term benefit of abemaciclib and its efficacy has been demonstrated here. Today, really, now that we understand how the CDK4-6 inhibitors work, what's the scientific basis for wanting to overcome that restriction point, where cells can proliferate um, unrestrictedly. Now that we know what the results of the trials are for the three approved agents, we want to look at some of those treatment-related toxicities and how we'll manage them. So we can see by our slide here that we have our mitigating treatment-related toxicities. They're hematologic, GI, liver, pulmonary embolism, and QT pro prolongation. 
And so our symptoms mostly, we know that when people have these symptoms and, and treatment related toxicities, you can be experiencing for the patient treatment delays and dose interruptions, which can influence the ultimately the tumor outcome for the patient and influence the ability for us to assess for treatment related toxicities. And we are, have recommended time periods for these treatment-related toxicities, which can be missed if we don't give the drugs on time. So it requires a lot of follow-up, especially calls to patients to confirm the start of their treatment cycle, and so we can have an accurate time frame for those treatment assessments. There's a mild increase in infection and in influenza on CDK4-6 inhibitors, but actually febrile neutropenia is pretty rare. So you can see that there's a crucial time point, 14 days after the treatment cycles, one and two for palbociclib and ribociclib, and for going through a one week after the start for GI toxicities after abemocyclib. So this is just a little chart that'll help you think about what the crucial points are for when we should be looking for these treatment toxicities. An important thing to know is that we always are trying to mitigate them by asking about symptoms. So we want to start with the symptoms of shortness of breath for um, hematologic toxicity, fatigue, bruising, bleeding. If people are experiencing diarrhea, we want to make sure the diarrhea is not a result of infection. So stool um, cultures are certainly important. If infection is ruled out, you can begin your antidiarrheal agents, and the sooner the better. And we want to assess people for abdominal pain, fever, weakness, anything that might be indicative of infection. We see sometimes in the liver toxicity, an asymptomatic rise in AST and ALT. And that occurs in about 2 to 4% of patients receiving pelvocyclib. In two patients who received pelvocyclib and letrozole in that trial, the um, hepatic failure and death were reported, so just in two patients. In the Mona Lisa study, there were grade three or four liver enzyme elevations in between six and nine percent of patients receiving ribocyclib and letrozole. In terms of pulmonary embolism, it's also rare, about two percent of patients, but we want to look for things like chest pain, shortness of breath, cough, tachypnea, tachycardia, and also the same things would come with a QT prolongation that can be associated with palbociclib and ribocyclib. This is dose dependent. So we want patients who are eligible to receive a CDK4-6 inhibitor to meet the criteria regarding cardiac status. We have to perform an um, electrocardiogram at baseline and to avoid any co-administration of other medications that can increase QT intervals. It's important to monitor serum potassium, sodium, magnesium, anything that's going to interfere, any electrolytes that are going to interfere with uh, the QT interval. And we do that especially in patients who have diarrhea or vomiting as QT interval pro prolongation increases with the declines in any kind of electrolytes. And I've tried to put things in when I show you uh, these slides in several ways. So one is to look at these critical time points and one is to look at reading the scientific literature in preparation for today. What is recommended? So overall, we want to do monitoring of the CBC, liver function tests, serum electrolytes, and a QT interval. And so you can see for abemocyclib and ribocyclib, it's day one, day 14 for cycles one and two, and day one for cycles three to six. And palbociclib, day one, day 15 for cycles one and two, and day one for cycles three and six, and as indicated. And as I said, that kind of is different than the other slide, which shows us the crucial time points. Why? Because this shows us a baseline. If you do it on day one, we have something to compare it to, and I think that's pretty important. In terms of liver function tests, when we want to uh, look at those again for abemocyclib and ribocyclib, again, days one and 14 for cycles one and two, and day one for cycles three to six, and then as indicated, does the patient have right upper quadrant pain? Do they have any jaundice? Do they have anything that indicates liver function problems? Looking at the um, electrocardiogram for QT intervals for ribocyclib, again, you want to have a baseline before treatment. Then looking at day 14 for cycle one, day one for cycle two, and then again as indicated. 
as patients, um, you know, their um, symptoms progress or not. And serum electrolytes we do throughout therapy, and we do them not only for ribocyclob, but, you know, mostly for all patients, and then as clinically indicated. We actually assess and grade adverse events by looking at the NC NCI, the National Cancer Institute's Common Toxicity Criteria for Adverse Events. And what's nice at looking at some of these toxicities is that when you look at things like blood, um, serum levels, e electrocardiograms, it's very quantitative. And so there, it eliminates one of the problems with the CTCAE, and that is some of the more subjective categories, like uh, neuropathy, for instance, has much more subjective grading when you look at things like deep tendon reflexes. So these are pretty quantitative. And you're looking at grade one with a, you know, for neutrophils with a, um, less than the lower limit of normal of 1500 and then grade two and so on. And again, we want to be able to look at the patient's blood work, be able to give them the accurate grading and be able to consult with our, the oncologist, with our um, you know, oncology team, letting them know when patients hit more of a grade two and what we might be doing about that. And to look at the trend of these counts and not just in isolation of what's today's platelet count, for instance. And that's happened to me many times where I've had patients as an advanced practice provider that have had a normal platelet count. But when I look back, the trend has been decreasing over time and it's not been noted anywhere in the patient's notes. So it's very important for us to look at trend over time. And as I said, febrile neutropenia is rare, but that's how we want to grade our, um, our events by looking at the CTCAE, following it closely and grading it accurately. So neutropenia generally with a CDK4-6 inhibitors is managed by dose interruption and dose modification while we would continue endocrine agents. If neutropenia occurs, then the inhibitor should be held and resumed at the next lower dose level. And I'm gonna show you some of the dose reductions that are recommended in the scientific literature. If neutropenia does coincide with pancytopenia, so now you're having not only neutrophils affected, but you're having your red blood cells affected and um, platelets affected and so on, you want to institute a bone marrow biopsy to detect possible cancer infiltration of the bone marrow. In terms of dose reductions, the recommendations are um, in combination with endocrine therapy are as noted here on this slide. So you start with your recommended, you know, starting dose and your, that's listed here. So it's 125 milligrams daily for pelpocyclib, ribocyclib 600 milligrams daily, and abemocyclib 200 milligrams twice daily. And you look at the dose reduction, it's, you know, um, down to 100 for pelpocyclib, 400 for ribocyclib, and 150 twice daily for abemocyclib. And then the second dose reduction is even another like 25% less than that. So you see um, 75 milligrams for pelpocyclib, ribocyclib at 200, so half of the first dose reduction, and then less than um, you go to 100 milligrams twice a day for abemocyclib. So that's the guidance for dose reduction, and that'll apply to some of you that are advanced practice providers, but also you caring for patients at the bedside, especially if you're teaching patients, making sure that they know what dose to take, when their dose reduced, how to take it, and making sure they're compliant with that as we monitor their blood work. When we look at diarrhea, we want to look at the number of stools per day. So looking at an increase of less than four stools a day over their baseline. So most people's baseline may be one to stool, two stools a day or less. And of course, some patients may have an ostomy. So we have to look at ostomy output as compared to baseline. And it increases to grade two by the number of stools per day. So here's where some of the, I'll say a little bit softer assessment comes in and what is grade four? What is life-threatening consequences or urgent you know, intervention? Well, of course, the patient becomes so dehydrated, their skin trigger is poor, they, they have confusion and other signs of electrolyte abnormalities that are very severe. So, you know, here's where you have to, you know, put your thinking cap on and kind of put the whole picture together of what the patient is 
how many stools they're putting out, what they're eating and drinking, what they look like, what their skin turgor looks like, what their vital signs are, what their labs are to decide if they are a grade four. But hopefully we are intervening way before that so we don't ever get to that point because diarrhea should be managed proactively. At the first signs of loose stools, again, if we're fairly sure that this is not infective, then we want to institute a diarrhea medication like loperamide, and it should be in initiated along with an increase in oral fluids. We have brought um, patients into our urgent care for cancer patients when they have not been able to maintain a lot of oral fluids for if diarrhea is also um, accompanied by vomiting, and certainly will give electrolyte um, a replacement and IV fluid replacement in that manner. I want to mention also that abemocyclib, unlike palbocyclib and ribocyclib, can lead to a grade three diarrhea. In the Monarch II trial, grade three diarrhea occurred in about 13% of patients treated with abemocyclib. So it's something we should be monitoring throughout. So again, this is just another uh, visual of how to go along with going through how we're going to treat and manage diarrhea, especially with abemocyclib. So in grade one, we'll continue with the same dose, we'll encourage oral fluids, we'll institute loperamide. In grade two, if that doesn't resolve within 24 hours back to about a grade one, we'll suspend the dose until we have resolution. There's no dose reduction required. When we start getting to grade three and you have persistent or recurring diarrhea, resuming the same dose despite all the supportive measures, then we'll suspend the dose until the toxicity resolves. And at grade three or four, again, we'll suspend the dose and resume at the next lower dose. So this is a good guide for clinicians and patients. In terms of liver toxicity, this is kind of a busy slide, but this is the CTCAE's recommendations. And so it looks at all the different liver markers, so alkaline phosphatase, ALT, AST, bilirubin, GGT, and signs of hepatic failure and portal hypertension. And what you're looking for is, especially in the first few, you're looking at the upper level of normal. And you're looking at that, you know, the increase from baseline and all these grades, grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. And grade five, obviously being death, we don't want that. So we wanna make sure we're looking at, again, quantitatively, What's the patient's baseline liver enzymes? What does it look like at baseline? And how much increase are we seeing? And if we're seeing that increase from grade one to grade two, grade two to grade three, you know what we're going to do about it at that point. And so we don't want to have a drug-induced liver injury. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring these, especially as I noted earlier on the slide, um, that we have baseline and we have progressive as indicated by the um, scientific literature, how we go about assessing liver toxicity. And managing it, well, we're gonna monitor it to distinguish between true liver toxicity and disease progression. So you're monitoring not only the serum levels of the liver enzymes and such, but you also may need liver scans, we may need an MRI, so we wanna look at what's going on in the liver to rule out disease progression. And Again, according to dose reduction, we want to treat it as um, great, the, you go from grade one to two, two to three per prescribing information. And that's how we manage the liver toxicity for these patients. And of course, we're always looking, using our nursing and clinician eyes and ears to talk about what the patient's symptoms may be. What are we seeing? Are we seeing petechiae, ecchymosis? Are we seeing jaundice? Are we seeing you know, patients having a lot of changes in their skin or in their sclera? Are we looking you know, at any other signs of um, liver enlargement? And so we want to look at all those things and plus patient reported symptoms of abdominal pain, nausea, things that suspect, make us suspect there's something going on either in the GI system you know, or the liver. And what we want to talk about too, remember we talked about the QTC interval. So we want to look at grading cardiac toxicities. We want to see um, if they have hypertension, prehypertension, heart failure, and 
QT prolongation. So what do we do with the hypertension? You know, any one of us knows that hypertension is chronic in the in the community. So people don't come to cancer with no other chronic illnesses. And many patients have prehypertension. So again, what we're looking is what are the patient's baselines? Are they prehypertensive to begin with? Do they have stage one or stage two hypertension? How is it being controlled? What drugs are we using to control it? Is it one, two, or three? Do they need triple therapy? And you know, we want to avoid those life-threatening consequences like malignant hypertension or hypertensive crisis. And so we want to make sure we're controlling hypertension throughout the patient's uh, treatment. In terms of heart failure, patients could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. And we need to look at brain natriatic peptide, cardiac imaging, see if they have symptoms. Do they have symptoms at rest, symptoms on exertion? or they had symptoms only in exertion and now they have symptoms at rest, we wanna make sure that we're looking and grading these appropriately. And here's where some of that subjective assessment comes in, because what are symptoms? Palpitations, tech, you know, so tachycardia, shortness of breath, weight gain, edema. And we wanna be able to look at that versus the patient's true baseline. So what was their baseline BNP? What was their baseline? echo, what was their baseline symptomatology, and make sure we're noting that throughout treatment. In terms of QT prolongation, you do the uh, electrocardiograms as indicated, as I mentioned earlier on the schedule, and looking at measuring it in milliseconds and watching the increase or not of the QT interval. We don't want to predispose patients to have any um, serious arrhythmia like torsades to points, you know, ventricular tachycardia or anything like that. Just so you know, also, there were no clinically significant effects on the QTC interval with palbociclib or abemocyclib. Ribocyclib has been shown to more likely prolong the QTC interval. <clears throat> so management, again, would do that ECG assessment before initiating treatment with ribocyclib and then monitoring it at each cycle, making sure we're monitoring electrolyte abnormalities, especially potassium and magnesium, and correct these before the start of ribocyclib, making sure if the patient has other problems like diarrhea, that we're also correcting that as they're going through treatment, making sure we're monitoring those electrolytes. And we wanna interrupt treatment until the electrolytes are corrected. So again, we look at that QTC prolongation and we're looking at the um, number of milliseconds, when to interrupt and when to uh, resume therapy at the next lower dose. This is just another visualization, nice little algorithm to take you through that. We also can have some renal toxicity and this has not been mentioned very much, but in Monarch 2, the increase in serum creatinine was observed in about 98% of patients receiving a bemocyclib. This increase in serum creatinine was resultant from the inhibition of a molecular pump that transports creatinine from the blood to the urine. And so in this drug, we look at elevations in serum creatinine that can occur within the first 28 days of a bemocyclib. And it re can remain elevated, but stable through the treatment period. But it seems to be always reversible when you discontinue treatment and can return to normal with treatment and discontinuation. The renal function using the glomerular filtration rate is not affected by abemocyclib. So now that we've gone through the drugs, we've gone through the side effects, we've gone through the management and assessment, Let's go talk about patient teaching. This is really important as we go through these novel therapies. Just in general, we're gonna teach patients general information about the drugs. We want them to take the dose at the same time each day. If a dose is missed, you know, take the next scheduled dose, don't double up. And to remind patients that palpocyclib must be taken with food, but the others, ribocyclib, abemocyclib, can be taken with or without food. We want them to take it with food, palpocyclib, to avoid GI upset. And remember, we're monitoring patients for neutropenia. So we're going to have a timely monitoring of their CBC. We're going to teach patients to have a high level of personal hygiene. 
So that's a lot of hand washing. And if anything has taught, if the pandemic has taught us anything over the last two years, it is a high level of personal hygiene. I bet people didn't wash their hands half as often then as they do now. So using uh, hand washing, how long to wash your hands, how to wash them, and to use sanitation, you know, hand sanitizer when you're not home to wash your hands, very important. Avoid crowds, avoid people who have infections like me right now, wear a mask, uh, report a fever of 38.3 or higher, um, in lasting one hour or more because we want to assess patients for neutropenia. In terms of GI or liver effects, we want patients and we want to teach them to report di diarrhea as soon as it occurs. We want to prevent dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. And remember, this also goes for any kind of nausea, vomiting. We want to treat that up front, take your antiemetics around the clock, and don't wait till you get nauseous before you take them. We ask patients also to report all over-the-counter medications, including herbal supplements to avoid liver dysfunction. We find that patients don't always report them. We don't always ask about them. And we really need to. A good question I always asked as a breast cancer nurse practitioner is, what else are you doing to help your cancer? Are you taking any supplements? Are you taking any herbs or you know any Chinese medications? Or And I say Chinese medicines because it's very popular, especially in certain parts of the country. And so I've learned to ask that question and you'd be surprised what I hear. We also wanna teach patients to avoid alcohol intake. Why? Because if we know we're gonna have some kind of GI or liver dysfunction, we certainly don't want them drinking alcohol. We also want them to report any weight loss, dark urine, jaundice, abdominal swelling, or pain. Again, these are the patient reported symptoms of liver dysfunction. In terms of cardiopulmonary um, toxicity, we want to have them report chest pain, shortness of breath, rapid heart rate or breathing, fainting, sweating, lightheadedness. Um, and even remember that your large emboli, your thrombolic events, especially pulmonary emboli can present as hypotension. And usually they have chest pain as well. I want you to know that thrombolic events were observed in only 2% of patients receiving palpocyclib and fulvestrant in the Paloma 3 trial. And grade four pulmonary embolism was observed in only 5% of patients treated with palpocyclib and letrozole in Paloma 1. In the Mona Lisa 2 trial, it occurred in two patients receiving ribocyclib with letrozole. So while it doesn't occur very often, we want to be um, attentive to it because it can be fatal. In terms of QT prolongation, again, you're going to monitor those electrocardiograms and have patients report palpitations and any episodes of fainting or near fainting. One important thing that I chose to put into this presentation today is talking about adherence to therapy. Because like patient teaching, there are great challenges to adherence. And I want you to know that adherence to oral CDK4-6 inhibitors remains an emerging challenge in cancer care. We have a lack of studies investigating adherence to CDK4-6 inhibitors. We know from prior studies, though, that patients who take, say, tamoxifen and adhered to their tamoxifen regimen, less than 80% had poor survival rates. So if we transpose that data into the CDK4-6 inhibitors, remembering that if you don't have that inhibitor on board, your cancer cells can now enter that progression cycle and bypassing the retinoblastoma protein and begin to progress, then lower adherence must also logically result in a poor survival rate and a decrease in invasive free disease-free progression. So we want to educate patients on our proper dosing, which ranges, and it depends on the drug, from every 12 hours with the bemocyclib to 21 of 28 days with ribocyclib or palbocyclib. And sometimes a patient may be having a second oral agent or an IM injection on days 1, 15, and 21 or, month, or monthly. So we have to make sure that patients are very clear on what they're taking, when to take it, how to adhere to it, what time to take it, the consequences of not adhering to it, 
and how to take their other medications as well. It's very challenging. We know that more than 50% of our newly approved anti-cancer agents with oral therapies in 2018. So now we have taken control out of our cancer realm and when we can bring everybody to the chemotherapy clinic and the patient and family have control over the timing, the dose, how often they take it and adherence. And there's no gold standard technique to quantify adherence. I know that people use pill counts and other things, but we really don't have a gold standard. And while I said 80% is considered acceptable, but is this enough for molecularly targeted agents? We don't know. Will less than 100% adherence result in treatment failure or patient death? We don't know. So for cancer and other chronic illnesses, so you look at hypertension, diabetes, other things, um, barriers to medication adherence have been identified. So the cost, so your socioeconomic status, your health literacy, whether you perceive this a benefit or not, your social support for taking those medications, your psychological state, are you depressed? Can you take them? Are you motivated to take them? How complex is your regimen? We've learned this with HIV. The more complex the regimen, the lower the adherence. And the side effects that come with these drugs and their food drug interactions. So there's a lot of teaching and reteaching to be done with patients every single time you see them. And so we can address cost through assistance programs by helping patients to apply. And I know we've I've worked with nurse navigators and other clinic personnel that have helped patients apply. The drug companies help patients apply. So we really have to use all our resources. We want to make sure patients are doing timely refills, help them with memory triggers, alarms, pill boxes, using calendars. And we have found that nurse-led telephone support or automated reminders are also been helpful um, in other studies of oral therapies. We want to educate patients again at each visit why it's always, always um, coming back to adherence and teaching and reteaching. We want to create a health literature at the sixth to eighth grade reading level so people understand what you're saying and they are not embarrassed by to say, I don't understand what you mean. We want to refer to support groups, especially metastatic breast cancer patients. And the reason I'll say that is I recently completed a study with metastatic breast cancer patients taking oral therapies. And what they told me is that once they left the clinic where they were getting like, say, you know, IV therapy, what they lost their whole navigation system, they lost their social support, they lost all their um, connections because they're doing it on their own and just going in for appointments. So we want to refer them to metastatic breast cancer support groups and encourage our facilities to institute some kind of um, nurse navigation for metastatic breast cancer patients especially as they navigate through disease progression. And we want to make the patient a member of the care team. We want to refer patients again to these advocacy groups, the National Breast Cancer Foundation and other um, advocacy groups for networking and building community and support. We want to keep our disease control and quality of life at the forefront of all our treatment decisions. We want to educate our patients and families. What are the goals of treatments and treatment options so they don't think cure is an option when they have metastatic disease? We want to be really clear about what our treatment options and goals are. We want to educate them about the CDK4-6 inhibitors and emphasize adherence, side effects, et cetera, and we're providing those resources and financial support. Okay, so our case study for this morning is Ms. M.K. She is a 60-year-old woman that presented with a left breast mass 3 by 3.5 in 2016. She underwent a lumpectomy with axillary node examination, which revealed N0. Tumor was ER positive, HER2 negative. She then received AC plus T, followed by six weeks of radiation. She completed five years of an AI in 2021. In May of 2022, she noted back pain and right quadrant abdominal discomfort, several small but measurable lesions to the liver and metastasis to the lumbar spine were found. So thank you, Abby. Would this patient be eligible for treatment with the CDK4-6 inhibitor? The answer is yes. 
what considerations would influence the choice of a CDK4-6 inhibitor? The ERPR, HER2 new status, first or second line therapy, early stage or metastatic disease state, or all of the above? All of the above is the answer. What assessments and monitoring should be instituted for patients taking CDK4-6 inhibitors? CBC, liver function tests, electrocardiogram, serum electrolytes, thyroid function test, hemoglobin A1C, serum electrolytes, and DEXA scans, MUGA scan, CBC, renal function test, and fasting glucose, echocardiogram, liver function test, creatinine clearance, and serum amylase. So the answer is A, because all of them have to be correct. So I could see why they chose serum amylase, but we would do all the liver function tests, so not just serum amylase. So the answer, correct answer is A. What supportive care planning may be needed for this patient? Toxicity and adverse event monitoring, self-management symptom reporting, Adherence promotion or all of the above? It is all of the above. Very, very much to talk about toxicity and adverse event monitoring, self-management, what to report to your healthcare provider, and adherence to the therapy. So I'm going to go through just some key takeaways. So you'll have these for your knowledge and referral. So know that endocrine therapy is the first line treatment in hormone positive who to no negative metastatic breast cancer. But endocrine therapy plus the CDK4-6 inhibitor is the first line treatment option in both de novo and postmenopausal women with recurrent hormone receptor positive HER2 negative or advanced breast cancer. And remember that we now can use abemocyclib for the high risk population. And our plan of care includes patient and family teaching, all the expected side effects reporting of adverse effects, self-management strategies, monitoring of all the complete blood counts, liver enzymes, electrocardiograms, patient symptoms, all this can prevent early detection of AEs. Remember, if patients are, how are off the treatment schedule because of a dose delay or treatment interruption, we have to call them at home. We have to check how they're doing. So making sure we're on schedule for, for following up with patients and strategies to enhance their compliance with treatment and monitoring intervals. Treatment considerations to be thought about in disease progression. What did the patient get prior to this? Did they get hormone therapy only? Did they get chemotherapy and hormonal therapy? And what response did they achieve? What's the extent of the patient's current disease? What's their performance status? What's the toxicity profile of what they're going to give them? And what we're thinking about for them with a CDK4-6 inhibitor? what patient and family education we're going to give them because this is key to adherence and the best outcomes. And to remember that we need additional research regarding long-term treatment toxicities and adherence. I wanna thank you for your constant attention during this time. The references follow here.